again to discuss things. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I am Sid Part 2. Joining me today is... Oh, I thought you were going to introduce us. Yeah, I thought so. I was, you were going to say something. I guess not. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, everybody. Please welcome Steve Baxi. Hello. And, uh, hey Steve, introduce me. Oh, and welcome the real man as creator of Red Knight. Hey, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> I like I like intense, awkward moments in, in podcasting. Right at the intro, I think it really creates just an immediately, I'm not going to give a fuck about this podcast and encourages people to click away kind of atmosphere. <laughs> that, that's what I believe. What do you guys believe? I mean, you're probably right. It's, it's hard to stop listening when an intro goes like this. Yeah, right? It's it's like one of those things like, oh my god, this is going to be so incredibly awkward. These guys have no idea what they're doing. Well, when you listen to a podcast and it goes silent for a minute, you you, you get up and check your your volume. Did you pause it by mistake? Did You know, is your computer, like, frozen? It's like, oh, yeah. no. <laughs> no, they just... They're just awkward people. <laughs> that sometimes happens when I like listen to some uh, videos. You know, the person like stops talking for a minute. Like, oh, wait, you know, I, I get back up and check my. What did I do wrong? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Like, did anyway, I, did I lose the connection? Oh. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, before we get into tonight's episode, though, I want you, the listener, to know you can download episodes of Geeky Gentlemen, so you can take these awkward moments with you on the go. You can uh, download old episodes of Geeky Gentleman by checking out the Geeky Gentleman playlist, leaving a comment on, on an old episode, and I'll upload it for you. Um, link in the description for this episode and multiple others. In any case, uh, Steve, what are we reviewing this week? Today we are talking about one of my favorite films of all time with by one of my favorite directors of all time. We are talking about... The Grand Budapest Hotel, directed and written and produced by Wes Anderson. Indeed we are. Um, okay. And, like, I I don't think I've sat through a Wes Anderson movie in its entirety, but I've caught them here and there. Really? I've caught bits and pieces of them. What's the one where, like... The entire family is geniuses, and they're all reading each other's Royal books. Cannons, so, uh, Royal Tannenbaums. Yeah, yeah, I've caught bits and pieces of that. I've caught bits and pieces of his other movies. I've just never, like, sat through an entire movie of his, but he's got a very um, recognizable style. It's kind of like a Tarantino film. You can go, oh, yep, there's the shot of the woman's feet. It's Tarantino. Um. <laughs> well, he's got such a framing device. You can really... The way he just positions cameras and creates seeds, you rec- you can recognize it. Um, yeah, it's, it's the tone of it all. It's it's this kind of like heightened goofiness. This this very um, I wouldn't even necessarily call it goofiness, but like hyper honesty. Because if you if the the consistent trait with all of his characters is that everyone literally says everything they mean. Mm-hmm. The subtext is not there in the sense that. You're not reading into dialogue. Exactly what you should be getting is happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's that, and just, like, he's got a, a quirkiness about the way his characters interact with each other and the way things happen. Like, you know, this the perfect example from this movie is when he wants his... Uh, when the young Zero wants his future wife to take instructions on how to get the painting, and he's like, here, hide this. No, take it anyway. And he just throws it at her. <laughs> That's such like an awkward, quirky kind of thing. And and it's like I've I've noticed that in what little of his movies I've caught bits of. So it's he's he's got a very particular style to him. He also tends to frame stories and he has a narrative um, where he kind of lays everything out. Sometimes 
you, you get an understanding of the universe and the characters within the first five minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Represents it like R Royal Tannenbaum's was a good example of that, um, almost like a stage play in sometimes, uh, yeah. which is, which is why, uh, oh god, um, uh, what's his first film? Um, uh, uh, the film about the kid at the school. What was that? Oh, um, fuck. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be any help here. Um, it's it's weird because now this is this whole thing is gonna turn into like an intro to West Anderson. I I just know it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I much prefer Wes Craven as a film. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not the Amazing Mr. Fox. I I keep thinking that's his first movie and it's not. He's been around for no, a number. No, uh, Bottle Rocket was his first film. Oh, okay, that's what it was. Or uh, Fantastic Rushmore. Mr. Fox. Rushmore. Was it was called. Film's called Rushmore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, Rushmore. I love Rushmore, but I, I swear to God, that happens a lot. Where it'll be on the tip of my tongue, the title. There's something about the title just escapes me sometimes. Where I completely forget the name of it. I'll remember everything about the movie. Mm. Uh, that's All of his movies are pretty memorable. Um, the Darjeeling Limited is one of my favorites as well. Like that's such a really uniquely designed movie. I haven't seen that one. What? what how? How? How would that compare? Um, top three. Okay. I think it's it's I think it's in my top three. It's it's certainly the most. It feels like that's the movie where Wes Anderson figured out who he was. Mm. Um, and this is the movie where he figured out how to convey everything that he is. Gotcha. Um, I always thought that was Royal Tannenbaum's, really. Um, because that film, because I saw Rushmore, and I remember seeing Bottle Rocket, and it, it, the his style seemed to really evolve and the way it was presented. I guess I guess you could make a case for that because it uh, I guess it was just another step in his creation process. Mm. You know, it's funny. Um, we, we talk about his tone. There's this little sketch video online that I highly recommend because it only gets funnier the more you know about video editing. And it's just called the edit button. And it's about this, like, program that just does literally everything for you, and it's completely ridiculous. But, like, you know, it's got this moment, it, they need to, like, have characters that are in a car crash. It's like, oh, let's add some smoke to this scene. So it just hits, like, command and then types in, add smoke. And suddenly there's smoke coming out of the cars, because that's what people think editing is, and it's just not. And he goes, and then we can we can add some other things, like we can change up the directing style. And so he puts in, like, Quentin Tarantino, and suddenly it's really violent, and there's, like, popular music from decades ago played in the background. And then he goes, or maybe we can try Wes Anderson. And suddenly they're, like, wearing short shorts, and it's, like, classical music playing, and mm -hmm. it's all bright colors and everything. They're, they're all very verbose and talking very quickly. So I think... I think that this guy's style um, has, it, it is immediately recognizable. Yeah, is I think the best way to put it. Um, um, and maybe to get it. more more into it, I think part of what makes Wes Anderson movies so good are that he understands how movies are presented. So like he plays with aspect ratios in this movie, but he does that all over the place. That bugged the fuck out of me. Really. <laughs> Oh my god, dude, I had to stop my TV and, like, figure out if I did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, the more of his movies you watch, the more you kind of, like, get accustomed to how he, how he plays those things. But, like, he understands movies are seen as flat. And so, like, there's very intentional geometry in how his characters moves and how comedy works for, like... When, when, when Gustav is, is being arrested in, in this movie, like, around the first 30 minutes... The police are there, he comes in from the back, and they start talking, and then when he knows he has he's going to be arrested, he runs towards the back, but the <laughs> entire scene is, like, composed to where everything is going left and right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really interesting, and there's a scene in um, Fantastic Mr. Fox, which is very similar to this, where, like, the character is running from one end of the screen to the other, and the comedy comes when something from the front of the screen hits him. <laughs> That's that's fun to play with dimensions and things. Um, I can never remember the name of the guy, but one philosopher was arguing aesthetics, and he, he put out the very bold, very unjustifiable claim 
that sculpture was the ultimate art form mm -hmm. because there was no one way you were meant to look at it. It had to look good from every conceivable angle. And, you know, I don't think that's a real argument, but whatever. But it's something that's no, always stuck No, it's the only me. thing. It's the only way. Well, no, it's just like... There's no other I mean, art form that does that. The, I mean, I can disagree, but still, like, the, the whole point being, though... No, of course I can just, What? Okay, anyway, the, the whole point being, though, it's like, it's funny that no one really, or that, that rarely do we address the, the fact we're reviewing, you know, what is still a novelty, historically speaking, three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional plane in this way. Because everything, of course, is shot. And so it's 3D at the time, but now it's 2D, and so there's certain conventions that everyone just follows because it makes natural sense. You know, it's it, you make this point, Steve, and... You know, everyone hates on this technology, but I'd be very curious to see what he would do with 3D glasses technology. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fascinating. Um, hmm. Because that's just one of those things, like, it, it's seen as such a gimmick, but there's obviously potential for further artistic expression, and as James Cameron will tell you, being able to pull your audience into your movie more and, and heighten it in that way. So I'd be curious to see what he could come up with. I hadn't thought about that. Actually, that does make sense. I like 3D when uh, there's actually layers in what you're seeing, and you can, like, push through the, the film. You know, the camera, like, takes you, you know, through the different uh, aspects of it instead of, like, you know, throwing, like, uh, you know, shit at you. Well, like, it's one of those things where so many movies that are in 3D, and this is, like, an entirely different conversation, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but so many movies that are in 3D are just two-dimensional films that were post-converted. Yeah. And yeah. very few are shot in 3D. And so when you're doing, like, a post- or a, a conventional film and you want to have something come at the camera, what you do is, like, let's say you have an actor running... You have your actor run close to the camera, but then go slightly off frame. And that's that's how you create the illusion of depth in two-dimensional film. Mm -hmm. But you, you add the third dimension, and now you can have your actor actually run directly at the camera, not veer off at all, until the la and, and just make a good cut at a certain point. And then when you're sitting there in the audience, something's actually moving towards you. Mm. So it's a completely different thing. So when the movie's actually shot in 3D... You can tell because it's intentional. It looks good that way. Whereas seeing it only in 2D is like, oh, well, he was kind of coming at me for half a second there, and then he just veered off the frame. So that happened. Mm -hmm. um, and and so like what what to get this back to what Steve was saying. So to have that scene where like he runs into the background of the shot, uh, that could be you you could do something more with that because like. You have all the, the police standing around him and, and the camera in that scene. If that had been something in 3D, then you could have had, like, the shoulders and the arms and stuff of the other police officers surrounding you, the viewer. Um, just, you could have done other stuff like that, and that, that'd that be interesting to see him work with that technology. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've always um, kind of thought a collaboration between someone like Andy Tarakovsky and Wes Anderson would be fucking amazing. Because <laughs> it would all be about line work and geometry and how these technologies work. I actually yeah. sometimes have wondered what Tim Burton and Wes Anderson would do together. Oh yeah, because some people uh, have compared some people have compared Wes Anderson to Tim Burton. Um, I could see that. I think Wes Anderson is smarter than Tim Burton. Yeah, I think that's the big difference. <laughs> um, Tim Tim seems to be kind of stuck in his ways, and. His biggest problem is he really has difficulty, like, getting out of the most obvious story constraint, uh, story designs, and, you know, characters. You know, when he when he makes a really good film, you know, like Big Eyes, I think Big Eyes is excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, or, um, actually, <laughs> that would have been an interesting film to co-op uh, with Wes Anderson, actually. Uh but yeah, Wes Anderson doesn't seem to have that kind of same problem, actually. You know, sometimes when I step into, you know, one of his films, I have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, like the film we're talking about, the, uh, the Grand Budapest Hotel. I had 
you know, you just sit there and just wait. You know, you just let the film kind of go. I, I never, I don't think I've ever really been ahead, you know, in one of his plots, you know, where I can be in comparison to Tim Burton. You know, Tim Burton, it's like, okay, this is going to be this, and this is going to be that, and that guy's going to be bad, and this is going to... Yeah, you can't call it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was not... I had no idea where this shit was going. I had no idea. It's... I mean, it's it's just such a weirdly, intricately structured movie where, like, there's a story inside of a story inside of a story. And, and that's a framing device that should not work. <laughs> yeah, it should yeah, But it's yeah. fucking I'm, genius here. It, it it should not work on any conceivable level. It is a girl reading a book. It is the author of the book talking to the girl about this story that he is being told by this other guy. The fuck kind of framing device? <laughs> you wrote if you wrote that in a screenplay and turned it into a screenplay writing class, the person would tell you, "Get rid of the fucking girl with the book. Get rid of the shit with the right the the writer." No, it's just it's the right. You start this shit at the writer having a conversation with the, the guy at dinner. Well, what, That's where this shit starts. Well, part of what makes Lothar Anderson, again, just so so smart is he's not one of those directors that like has a script and then shoots the scripts and finds the vision for the story and shooting it. If you look at his scripts, he has intricately laid out how the shots for these scenes are going to work. He will write in annotations of like, you see this person talking while there's like, well, they're like, you cut between this person or like these two things are being compared or the music is going to play like this. Like he's, the movie is in his head. He's just making it real. You know, it's interesting that we're talking about someone who is that precise ahead of time with his films. I, I really wonder what it would be like. I don't believe he's done any sequels, but we were talking last week about filming multiple movies at the same time. I wonder what would what something he did would be like if that was the case. Yeah, could, if you were filming multiple movies at once mm. that, in a franchise. Since he's like that precise and a lot of our conversation last week was about the like perfect moments that you can't get if you just film two movies at one time. Yeah. Um... No, that'd certainly be interesting. Um, Wes Anderson, despite all of his intricacies, though, I don't think he's ever made like an overly long movie either. So I can't even imagine like a Tarantino situation where he like kill bills it and turns one movie into two. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is this is like nice. This is only like an hour and a half, and it it felt longer than that though. It, it, it's just so engaging. Yeah, it's really dense, and you really get to feel like you're getting in very short bursts a lot of information I, I i love the way he just displays it like that mm -hmm. yeah um okay steve take us somewhere like firmly related to the movie then okay um well like i said this is this is one of my favorite movies Wes anderson is one of my favorite directors he's in my like top three i love him um so part of what i why i wanted to pick this movie is i wasn't sure Ian, if, you, if you've seen much of anything of his work, and so I wanted to talk, like, I wanted to do a film review that wasn't just, like, here is the script and I am analyzing, but by the way, there were pictures. Um, I wanted this to, like, be very firmly in, look at these actors and look at how it's structured and look at how it's shot and look at how it's designed. Um, the thing that really got me about this movie the first time I saw it is that you put it on mute, you look at the color palette, and you look at the set designs and, like, the painted backgrounds and stuff, it's fucking gorgeous. Uh, the designs, the use of like the color pink and the shades of it, the way the Grand Budapest Hotel is itself designed is fantastic, especially with the fact that Wes Anderson likes like those long tracking shots with multiple pieces in the air constantly. And he doesn't do the thing that you that a normal person would do, which is you have a hundred things going on and you just film it constantly. He has a hundred things going on and he's filming it from multiple perspectives, but it's always confined within like that very linear right and left, back and forth way. Like he has this perfect sense of geometry that the architecture is working with perfectly. I agree. I think Ian's taking a break. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I, I like his other movies a lot too, but I feel like Grand Budapest Hotel is the one where like he really nailed that. Yeah. Um, Fantastic think... Mr. Fox is a little bit... It's more complicated because it's a stop-motion movie, but I feel like even that wasn't like as intricately designed as this. And Moonrise Kingdom is really intricate for the characters, but like it's not a 
It's not a unique location. No. I'm really. I'm trying to think. You know, I tend to usually go... Uh, probably back to Tannenbaum's is my favorite Anderson film. Um, kind of go back and forth. I really love Moonrise Kingdom. Mm-hmm, me too. Uh, and... And Budapest is... I don't know, it's just, it was one of those films where I sat there and I was like, you know, I never really call Anderson my, one of my favorite directors when I talk about my favorite directors, but yeah, he's one of my favorite directors. Because he's never let me down. I've never been let down by one of his films. I agree. Hey guys, sorry about that. No, cool. That's okay, right? Yeah, my fucking speaker just died and I had to go search the apartment for my headphones. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> You sounded like you kept the conversation. Going. We tried. We tried. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so yeah, I missed literally all of that. I was like, "Hey, Steve, take us somewhere." And then as soon as Steve started talking, <laughs> um, basic basic recap is part of the reason I wanted to talk about this movie and this director in general is I get bored with reviews that are just like, "Let's analyze a script," and by the way, there are pictures. Um, so I want to focus as much as we can on like the way the sets are painted and designed and the architecture and, like, how the hotel itself is so intricately layered and, like, how this movie, more than any of his others, is very specifically designed to be consumed visually. You cannot sell this as a script. It's not a script. It's a movie. It is interesting because I, I do feel like a lot of people go, and, and our dear friend Captain Logan being one of them, well, I'm a story guy. Well, then go review novels. Um, and, you know, that's that's obviously more harsh than it, it's meant to sound, but, like, film isn't wholly a narrative medium. It is a medium that uses narrative and visuals and blends them. And so, yeah, to watch something like this, it tells a really intricate and interesting story with fascinating characters, but it does it so much through visuals like the the scene in the museum with um Jeff Goldblum's character and <laughs> uh what's his face fucking green goblin oh yeah um, yeah, Willem no. Willem Dafoe. yeah yeah the the scene in the museum with those two there's not a fucking line it's all done visually and it's intense as hell well i mean and then the thing towards the end where um the girl's running, and Adrian Brody's just walking past the hall slowly and methodically. Yeah. Like, it's it's just so... The visual style is the story. Mm-hmm. He's one of those directors... Uh, I guess we have, a, we have a good handful of directors that really do understand that film is a visual medium. You can tell a story uh, through the narrative just with the visuals. Mm-hmm. And it can come across. You don't have to spoon-feed every, like... You know, information. Um, yeah, it drives me crazy that like people will actively ignore visual cues in films and say it's a problem with the movie that they don't explicitly state every little factoid, right? Yes. Like, um, the instant I hear somebody say, nothing happened, that's kind of when they lose me as like a serious critic. I don't mean, I, I have my moments like that too. There's, there's a fine line between, okay, you gotta you gotta be smart and pick up on stuff on your own, and, alright, come on, dude, it's still a fucking movie. On some level, you've gotta, you gotta hold my hand somewhere. Um, there's a fine line there, but, but I do agree that I think, uh, we, we expect too much to be spoon-fed to us, uh, as, as a movie-going audience sometimes. Um... So yeah, like there's there's tons of stuff in this that that does just communicate everything you need to know visually. Uh, like the, I love the scene where they're going up to the monastery, and <laughs> you just keep getting the same line over and over again. <laughs> but like, what makes it all fascinating are all the the ridiculous. Um, oh, what would you even call those? Rendezvous or or changeovers baton passes i don't know what you what you want to what phrase you want to use but as they get up to that damn mountain it just takes them through all these same things and like in the script that would just read as are you blah 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 blah, blah? <laughs> yes come with me that it'd be the same line 10 times so it's just fun how that works out 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, setup and payoff is a thing um, that someone like Shane Black does a lot, where like his, his formula for a script is everything that is seen has to be paid off somewhere. Everything is, is connected as much as possible. Um, but he's a script guy, so like visually some of that setup and payoff is there, but that's always going to be like a bit of an afterthought. It's going to be part of the directing. That might not necessarily be how he writes it. Wes Anderson's concept of, of setup and payoff is so much more intricate than that, where, like, just characters being present is somehow a setup and a payoff for something. <laughs> um, like, the guy that was wrapping the painting before they left was a setup for the payoff later. Like, it's it's nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are these weird little things where, like, I feel like you can't have Wes Anderson if he didn't have lots of friends. Because he uses pretty much the same actors in almost all of his movies. Um, and, like, I, if I was William Dafoe, if I wasn't friends with Wes Anderson, why would I be in this movie? Uh, yeah. Like, there, there's just <laughs> such minor roles that mean such massive amounts that, as an actor, I wouldn't understand how you convey that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think sometimes actors... Once, once a director, like... Anderson uh, becomes respected and when he, once they have a style. You know, there are some actors who will work with a director like that, even if it's just a small bit part. Because, um, you know, even, like, popular actors, you know, do a lot of shitty films and do a lot of stupid, shitty, like, you know, speed twos. And, you know, <laughs> Defoe has to do a speed two uh, uh, every so often. And, okay, I do, like, three speed twos, but I get to do like, two of these kind of films. Um, you know, it, it would even be worth it just to even do a smaller part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um... I don't know, man. The 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 cast in this... Do you... Do you feel like some of them are maybe just a little distracting from, like... Like, it pulls you out of the movie for half a second. So... I don't know, like, when Bill Murray and Owen Wilson showed up, I was like, oh, hey, it's Bill Murray, or oh, hey, it's Owen Wilson, and then I kind of like, oh, wait, shit, what's going on again? I feel like, I mean, th this just might be because, like, this is a later movie for him, and I've seen everything up to this point when this came out, so, like, I'm just used to him having these actors there all the time. Like, I'd be more out of it if Bill Murray wasn't in the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and Owen Wilson helped him write, like, his first two or three movies, so, like, I feel like he, if he wasn't it, I'd also be weirded out. Edward Norton's in a lot of his movies. Like, it's just, it's a common casting. It's a Whedon thing. Like, Whedon has the same actress through everything, and so, like, I yeah. I carry their character names, but I also recognize that, like, he hires them because they understand how to deliver his writing. It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's very similar if you see a Sam Raimi film and Bruce Campbell isn't in the film. Right, exactly. You kind of wonder where he is. Why couldn't he be in this movie? Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's fair for, like, him and, and, again, his style, but for me, I just, like, you know, it's just, oh, hey, it's Owen Wilson, I wonder what he's gonna do. He's gonna, he's gonna work a desk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, just shit like that, I'm like, like, when it's Edward Norton at first, I'm like, oh, hey, Edward Norton, but then his character his role is actually important and, and drives the plot forward. And you can even make that argument for Bill Murray, too, though, again, it's a very small role. Defoe, his character drives the plot forward, all these things. Seriously, Owen Wilson is just around. I, I almost feel like he was just, like, bored on a Sunday afternoon and knew Wes Anderson was making a movie. He's like, hey, you need, uh, need anyone else for this part? <laughs> Got any open parts for me? <laughs> uh, it's a little bit like that. Um, I mean, Jude Law's in this, and I, I mean, again, if I was Jude Law, and someone's like, I need you to just be in this movie for a collective of maybe five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't understand why I would say yes to that, but here we are. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Goldblum is in this to deliver exposition. Literally all he's doing. And die. And die. And die beautifully. But, like, it's weird. This cast is really fucking massive, especially when you look at, like, how many small parts are in it with big-name actors. Like, Jeff Goldblum's there, Edward Norton's there, Bill Murray. Um, that woman who plays the Bond girl from Spectre, whose name I can't remember, the French woman. Um, 
Tilda There's Swinton's a lot of them in it. all over the place. Tilda Swinton's in this movie? Yeah. Hmm. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, the casting's, I mean, it's cool. Everyone's fucking fantastic in it. Um, I don't know. It just works, man. I have a, I, I've always wanted to, like, sit down and write something about a Wes Anderson movie, but, like, I've never known how do I do that. Like, <laughs> it's one of those things. This and Steven Universe are the only things I've had this with, where, like, I mean, I could explain it to you, but you should just watch it. Mm. And if you, it, like, there's something that's unauthentic about me telling you what makes this movie tragic and sad, or what makes Steven Universe a beautiful family, it, that you just wouldn't get if you if you heard it from me instead of watching it yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an experience. Like, that's that's kind of the best type of movie for me, where, like, it has to be watched. You you can't do anything else about it. Oh, so it's, like, the perfect thing to have a podcast review of, then. Yeah, and, I'm, again, this is why I <laughs> wanted to talk about this, because, like, this is not a thing where we can just talk about plot and story and scripting. It doesn't work that way. Oh, wow. I guess, yeah. I guess you can, <laughs> I guess the next one we'll do is David Lynch. Exactly. Oh, God. Exactly. We'll just talk about all of Twin Peaks at once. Yeah. Oh, fucking Christ. No. <laughs> all right. All right. Watch Blue Velvet once. Then, that was that was an odd experience. Then it's agreed. We're going to do Mulholl, Holland Drive. Oh, my oh. God. I, I still don't understand that movie. Oh, man. That's a great film. Don't you fucking look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I remember I was listening to a radio show, like, morning show years ago, and they were, like, you know, immature shit. They're going around saying, what's your favorite thing to say in bed? It's like, oh, yeah, do me harder. Oh, yeah, that's it. And then one guy was like, don't you fucking look at me. And then, like, it was honest, I, I heard that before I saw the movie, and then when I saw the movie, all I could do is laugh at that scene. Um, um, that's the scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know where exa- where else to take this necessarily, but, like, there's just so many desperate parts moving around that, that do a lot of things. How did you guys feel about the fact that the movie was divided into, like, seven sections? Um, do you think it needed that or no? I didn't have any problem with it. I didn't either. I was just curious. Um, I think it works because it's chapters of a book. Yeah. So I think that makes sense. Um, like, like, if you look at it from the perspective of that framing device, then suddenly this entire movie is that girl sitting there and reading. You know, I, you know, a lot of, you know, I, I sometimes think if uh, one of his best, if one of his biggest influences is um, storytelling through novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder if prose is like a big uh, influence for him because uh, that's one of the things I thought about when I first saw like um, like Tannenbaum's uh, and the way you know all the characters explained you know right up front uh, that was a lot like you know what you would get in a novel about a massive group of characters yeah and you know uh, some people compare uh, Tarantino's storytelling to to uh, to a novelist and I would agree with that and I think I think. I think that's the way Anderson does as well, uh, which is wonderful because, you know, so many people have so many problems, like, um, adapting <laughs> novels into film and will tell you, well, hey, we had to make it dumber because this is film. And I don't know. Film, filmmakers like Tarantino and Anderson prove that, no, you don't have to be dumber uh, just because mm-hmm. you go to another uh, narrative. When when we cut from the girl to the guy sitting at his desk telling us about stories, and you realize that the monument that the girl's looking at is just called the author, um, suddenly this movie becomes like this really interesting argument for how stories work in general. Like, yeah, writing a novel and, and writing a movie and writing a TV show, these are different things, but like, there is this inherent structure to it that just comes from human experience and human interpretation and like when you get towards the end of this and you realize Zero marries marries this girl it's just told in narration as like a matter of fact way like oh by the way she dies and so does his son mm-hmm. um, like there is this weird interconnected human experiencing that the author talks about in the beginning of the movie that plagues this whole thing where like 
People are being bluntly honest. People are cutting themselves off. People are being extremely forward about everything, and yet you're still not quite uncovering all the layers to it. Just like having a book in front of you is not the same thing as knowing everything about the book. Yeah, like, and, and you're right, because as soon as it starts really getting going, like when we first get to the concierge and everything, um, one of the first things we see him do is is talk about, like, oh, no, you're fine, you're fine, and then he just, <gasps> your nails are hideous. <laughs> uh, just You would never say that to anyone. <laughs> like, you would never look at someone and go, oh, my God, you have something in your teeth. And, and, like, even if you were to tell someone they had something in your teeth, you would never do it in that fashion. So it's just so upfront and apparent. So it's, like, daring you to try to find, not the subtext, but the true meaning. I don't know. Um, yeah. Like, there, there is a blunt honesty, but, like, the honesty is almost disarming. Like, if you go back and you watch Moonrise Kingdom, Moonrise Kingdom has this thing where, like, all the characters are bluntly honest, but part of what makes the acting in that so subtle is that everyone is really stiff and everyone is really matter of fact and no one has like any genuine emotion and so like there's an air of humanity that gets, that gets lost with honesty and like in this movie the honesty and the emotion are blent together and so like the sub the deeper subtext is is tonally this movie is does not look like an epic multi-layered tragedy but that's what it is yeah, um, and it's weird that it's a tragedy, and yet it has such a, a goofy, quirky tone to it. Yeah, and I think that's um, part of what makes it so interesting, is that, like, the structuring of events does a lot to alter the meaning of those events. Like, even a, if you had a very clear message painted across your face, like all the characters' dialogue, the surrounding material conditions of that dialogue still alter how you feel about it. I can tell you the color this I can write a sentence that says this color is blue and have the font be green and suddenly there's a different it it feels different or you can make a painting of a pipe and then write in Spanish exactly this is not a pipe exactly <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly so and then that kind of people thing. fucking scratch their head about that for decades yeah, it's, um, it's like that's the treachery of images this is the treachery of language this is the treachery of film Okay, to talk about the story for a second, though, um, just the story itself, I find it interesting that the tragic element comes so seemingly out of the blue. Like, you know, in order for this to be a happy story, the movie only needs to end, like, about five minutes earlier. And... Our heroes have won the day, everything's worked out for them in the end. But then we get those extra couple minutes, and we find we get the epilogue basically of what happened to these characters, and then it's so fucking sad. Yeah. That's actually an interesting point, but um, you know, when you think about it, almost most stories have a tragic ending, really. Um, like, like, um, like Ed Wood, Tim Burton's Ed Wood. Uh, Ed Burton ends that film with Ed Wood having his, his uh, successful premiere showing uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space. And, you know, he ends it there with him driving off, uh, feeling pretty good that he succeeded, maybe done Bella in one last film. You know, after that, you know, Ed, Ed's life, you know, continued to get shittier. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. he died, you know, broke. He died like, drunk. Uh, but we end the movie there. Um, like if you did a Princess Diana film and you wanted a happy ending, end it when she marries uh, Dodi Fayed. You know, <laughs> you know, don't end it <laughs> with the car crash. Um, so, well, I mean, there's, so that's kind of what's, this is what what's the, talked about in this, yeah, though, and, right? Yeah, the, and you're right. He could have ended it like, uh, you know, he could have you know, totally ended the story, you know, where he did. But we get to see, you know, what happens, you know, later in life for them, and, you know, you know, not so good when, uh, you know, the politics in uh, Europe change. Yeah, and it's just interesting because, how, how to put this, um, you have this idea of, like, inevitability, and, and they bring this up in the movie, like, 
certain things are inevitable, death being one of them. Um, one of my favorite memories from philosophy classes was my professor telling us all, yeah, everyone in here knows they're going to die, right? And that seems like such a, like, you know, cute little quip or, or whatever, but there's a very firm reality to that that people seem to not accept. And so in stories, we don't think of our characters dying so much. And John Green wrote a whole fucking book about this. Uh, like, what is, like, the the, the whole um, theme of that book or, or one of the, the things going on in that book is what happened to these characters after the story ended? And on one level, there's an answer, nothing, the story's over, the characters don't exist, they're not real people. But on the other end, there's an answer, it doesn't necessarily get better or worse. There's an inevitability of death here. Mm -hmm. Um and especially in the context of this, there is an like we we see that they are in a world in which Nazis, um, far right powers are rising, and they're in that part of the world at that time. It's maybe a little too much wishful thinking to think everything will turn out all right just because one of these characters we're seeing is now old. Well, that that's what makes part of this really interesting because like I I don't completely agree like the, the happy ending if you caught it like five minutes earlier because the way the movie plays like the tragedy is there from the start. Um, you know where Zero ends up. The movie opens and you have that thing where like when you see the newspaper where when the woman dies above that it's about World War II about to start. Um, mm -hmm. the, the whole train scene, like, that's, I love that scene where he's talking in the train about, like, about human frailty and people and relationships and stuff, and he just cuts it off and he's like, oh, fuck it. Like, there, there, there's a blunt honesty that no one in this movie is really that happy. There's those cuts of, like, how Gustav spends his day and he's just alone and sad and sitting in this tiny room eating. Um, huh. like, no one's happy. You can cut the story off with a happy ending, but it doesn't turn it into a happy movie because these little narratives that people weave themselves into are not an escape from how their life actually works. Just like us sitting here watching a movie doesn't alter the things we have to deal with when the conversation's over. No, that's that's true. I was just talking more like generally. It, yeah. it feels – you're left with a happier feeling because our characters have triumphed. And you're not you're thinking about the triumph if you end it five minutes earlier, as opposed to again the grim reality. Right, and but then again, if you end it five minutes earlier, like it's it's a weird false ending too, where like the happiness doesn't like you, you're right, you're left with a happy ending, but like the more you think about it, the more the happiness is just it's false, it doesn't really exist. Yeah, and and so that's why the the true ending of it functions because it serves to remind you of that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Like, I, this, I don't. I don't know if I'd say it doesn't exist. I'd say that it's fleeting. Yeah, fleeting would, would that be fair. more fair? Fleeting is the part. Um, yeah, like, because clearly there there are happy moments in this, even though there is like a sense of dread and tragedy around it too. There the is. Care, like there's there's always, you know, people find I think the the best way to deal with their situation. Even when you're in a, a shitty situation, you still have a sense of humor most of the time at least some people do you still find ways to to grin and bear it and so there are still happy moments like the the wedding scene in this even though it were immediately given a very tragic note as soon as we see it happen is still in and of itself a happy moment immediately cut with reality again yeah yeah um the thing where when we cut to the chapter after gustav's in jail um and, like, it's played for comedy, but, like, he beat the shit out of someone so that he he doesn't <laughs> look like he, he can get... He, so he doesn't look like people beat the shit out of him. Um, it's a funny line, but, like, there is this cut between the first... <laughs> the part before he's... After he's arrested and he's in jail, where, like, his life is hell. Mm -hmm. Um... It, it's part of, like, this hyper-honesty in the movie where, like, again, everyone says exactly what they're feeling. Everyone says exactly what they're doing. And so everyone connects more naturally, but they also understand more naturally about how shitty everything is. Yep. Yep. Um, that is one of my favorite cuts in the whole movie where, like, he's arrested and suddenly we're talking to him in jail and everything's wrong. I love, like, you don't even see him arrested. You see him running away from the guy. Like, he's... Uh, I love that scene. That is one of the funniest like, things. 
I love that. Movie. He's so it's such a ridiculous fucking scene because he's like, okay, now you know, straight faced, don't say anything if you get arrested. All right, they go downstairs. Oh, so you think so? She's been murdered, and you think I did it. And then he just fucking runs away. He, like, immediately breaks. That's so fucking... Like, that caught me so off guard. I did not expect that at all. And that's kind of, like, the, the true root of humor, right? You just have to, like, subvert expectations. Because you expect him to try and play it off and, like, have them know or, like, some kind of evidence is revealed or whatever. But he just totally outs himself by running away. There's just... It's all over the dialogue, too, where, like, Adrian Brody's character first shows up, and, like, he calls him a fucking faggot, and then, like, the, and then there's a line where, where, like, he contradicts that, and he's like, I thought you said I was a fucking faggot, and he says, well, you're fucking bi. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, it's... God, people that, have that... a hard time even, like, getting... keeping consistency with their honesty. It's hilarious. Just that moment where he turns and runs. Um, yeah. It's delivered, like... Like an old school Sherlock Holmes film, like he's going to like solve the mystery right there. <laughs> <laughs> he just turns and runs like an episode of Cops. Well, like what's really funny is it takes the it takes the police like a moment to realize what just happened. Yeah, that's so great. And that was really that uh, that felt that had a real honesty to it. That really felt real. Like, oh wait, huh? What? Because that's how <laughs> usually people react to shit like that. <laughs> Like, you just, they're just so like, oh, shit, no, he he totally seemed like he was cool. He came down the stairs so confident and everything. Um. <laughs> it's even set up a little bit more, because, like, on the train, he knows this police officer. Like, they're almost friends. Yeah. You think they're going to oh, talk was... about it, but no. How, how did you feel about the, the way the first meeting on with the police on the train is paralleled with the second meeting? Um, because they they shoot that exactly the same yeah. way, only the second time it's in black and white, and that was really interesting to me. It, I mean, because it, it it connects also to like that that priming World War Two feeling, um, where like there's a really complicated context going into that first train ride, and so like this feels like it's just a tangential thing that almost doesn't matter, um, and so like it it it's almost like it. The, fil- the filter of this movie, the colors and stuff, don't alter because everything's still going where it's supposed to be going. This is just something else trying to intrude on it because, like, to match the black and white color scheme, the guards are also in black and white. But then you do it again later, and suddenly these outside forces that are intruding on your narrative have stolen the narrative, and so the color shifts to match them. Yeah. And, like, the world has altered, the people have altered something about the emotional experience now is not yours anymore, and I think that's really interesting. <sighs> it's... It it really does catch you off guard, especially the way in which they end it. Um, like, because it, it feels like it's going to be another weird situation, like maybe the, the police uh, captain's going to show up again or something, or maybe just through this guy's sheer dumb luck, it's all going to work out for him again. But something about the the black and white uh, film, like, in the back of your head, you know that's not the case. And there's such a finality to it that you don't even need to see it happen when they just say, they shot him. That's like, like, they even tell you, he didn't get the chance to grow old. Then that scene starts up, and then it just ends with, and they shot him. It's such a weird way to write, basically, because you think Ralph Fiennes is your main character for most of this. Zero really is, but, like, it's almost a co-protagonist thing. It's hard to not picture this movie without Ralph Fiennes. It's such a weird way to get write your character out of the ending of the movie. He just gets shot. It's over. Yep, but, I mean, that's the reality of it, right? Yeah. It's just, there's sometimes, like, so often when... If we ever get to this point, because, you know, it's a whole separate rant about not killing characters, but so often when a main character dies in a film, it's this big thing, like, everything was leading up to this moment, everything was serving this purpose, and for this one, no, he dies incidentally. Yeah. As a result of, yeah, who he is and how he acts and everything, but that's... It's not like everything was leading up to this confrontation with the Nazis on the train. I, it's just so out of the blue. And that's that's reality. That's life. You know, not everybody gets a death that's triumphant. 
Uh, mm-hmm. That's just how it is. And uh, that actually reminds me of the death of the lead character in uh, No Country for Old Men, actually. Oh, yeah. And he dies off camera. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's one of those things that, you know, I, I, I'm kind of bugged when people complain about a character death when when it happens so suddenly like oh why didn't they give him you know this moment it's like yeah i don't know I, it's cool when they do that in, in stories uh you know and whatever the medium but it's not altogether honest if that's always the way characters die and i don't believe in doing that as a rule Oh. You know, it's. I think it's symptomatic of a larger thing, because um, you were talking about this earlier, Steve, where everything is set up and paid off, and that's that's usually considered good writing when everything is set up and paid off, when, when every single little thing does actually mean something. Like, ideally in a novel, nothing is incidental, everything matters, right? Yeah. Every word has a purpose. But that's not how life is. Sometimes people just say some random shit that doesn't mean anything because they mistakenly said some random shit that doesn't mean anything. And, you know, someone made this point on Twitter, and I I thought it was actually really good. Where it's like, just because someone misspeaks does not mean that there's a conspiracy. It can mean that someone just misspoke. Um, And, and like, so how, how often do you see characters just say something by accident just because they said something by accident, but not because it, like, is symptomatic of a deeper character flaw or or an important piece of, of material for advancing the plot or anything. And so this incidental death that is a reflection of his character, but that's just how... A, it's a believable situation in an incidental way. Um, I, I find that really fascinating well, I mean, how that all works together. And even to go to a even more minimal example when you, that you mentioned earlier with the nails, like the fact that her nails in the opening of the movie don't look bad means nothing. Mm-hmm. He, he just said it because he felt like saying it, and that's kind of how people are sometimes. Yep, uh, it's it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that that whole kid reaction thing. Where kids will just say that kids say the darndest things. Um, to give real life example, my father always told me this story. I have no idea if it was true or not because I was too young. But apparently, we were at McDonald's in line, and the girl behind the counter doing the you know register had a nose ring, and I was like three years old, and I go, Dad, I thought only horses and and cows and pigs had rings in their nosies. And the whole fucking, uh, like, lineup laughed their asses off. I imagine the poor girl was probably embarrassed as shit. Like, it's just that from the mouths of babes thing, right? Like, sometimes people will just say exactly what they're thinking. And when that happens as you're an adult and you don't realize what you've just done until after it's already left your mouth, uh, it's just... I don't know, it's just one of those things where how often do you actually see something like that portrayed in fiction? Well, if you go it's to... so rare. If you decide to at some point look at more of his movies, I think you'd really like Moonrise Kingdom because that's essentially what that movie is about. It's about childhood, it's about adulthood, it's about innocence, and about it's about honest expression. Mm-hmm. Um, like, there's a very running, telling theme about that where, like, the world is complicated and we say things we don't mean and we live the lives we're, su- we're we think we're supposed to but like there are two kids and like they don't want to do that they just want to be kids and they love each other and that's okay for them but at some point that has to fade away too and the world takes it away very naturally um god don't get me into heidegger please i'm just good <laughs> I'm, I'm so ready to just get into the fucking heidegger and it's Being gonna be a whole thing death. If there's one yeah. recurring theme in all of Wes Anderson's work, it is being towards death. That's the fucking... Like, God damn it! I'm gonna be like... You're gonna have me here, like, we're gonna take a leap from a leaping off realm, but we will not relinquish the, that which we have learned thus far in our leap. But in leaping, we will relinquish some information. Fucking Christ. God damn it. It's, it's, that's what it is, man. <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm gonna be like this now. It's gonna be such a fucking problem. But yeah, that is also not an accident, is by the way, because Wes Henderson has a philosophy degree. Just saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that is one of those things where like this is something Heidegger addressed: the idea that we are so obsessed with 
what we're going to be doing or what we have done that we're so often not living in the moment. And so part of of the goal of being is to just accumulate the knowledge that you need to accumulate to be a functioning adult, but be able to go back to uh, the mentality you had as a child of just accepting things as they come and not dwelling on them or trying to plan for every eventuality. There's this this weird just being fuckingness that you have to you have to strive towards and part of our the problem is our society does not function in a way that is um helpful toward that. He the, he also has the Heidegger concept of truth, I think, is really interesting, where he says truth is disclosure, and the issue with that is you can never know one thing completely. Like, he uses art as his definitive example of truth, where he says, like, if you have, a like, a statue, you can't ever look at every side of the statue at once. It doesn't work that way. And so, like, particularly with the way Wes Anderson's movies are structured you have like a very finite grasp of how things are supposed to be looked, but with the way he's plays with aspect ratios, with the way characters are killed off screen or the way like they don't necessarily connect to other aspects of the film itself. It, it always feels like everything that's going on is important and it's had, it has truth in some respect, but it's, it's always going to be how you look at it. It's always going to be what parts of it are shown to us and what parts of it are invisible to us, and that's what makes it terrifying and interesting and emotional all at once. Yeah, and there's there's so much of that. Like, we, we focus on the, the big character death in this, but, like, that scene where the fucking guy just goes to it and kills all the guards? Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that seems fucking nuts, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Like, they just open the thing, and the guards see him, and it's like, oh no, and the dude just doesn't fucking hesitate, just like, oh, excuse me, and he drops down there and murders everyone. <laughs> it's so fucking matter of fact. <laughs> it's like he just, like, tightened a screw or, like, I don't fucking know, fixed a leaky pipe. Um, Just the way he just fucking hopped to it is so damn amazing. Uh, and then it just cuts to this fucking gory ass shot it almost feels like you know sometimes when you're watching like a movie on television um like uh, on network television and they edit out certain parts because they're too violent to show on broadcast it almost feels like i watched the edited version <laughs> like i'm supposed to see that whole tussle and i just didn't <laughs> That that seems so like with any other movie you would have seen that that'd been very important very like it's it's a fucking prison escape where at the last possible second the guards catch them and then one of the prisoners has to die to murder the guards and so so the rest of the prisoners can escape any other movie that's a really fucking intense scene where there's like either a really cool action scene or just a really really you know heart pounding edge of your seat fight. And here it's just played in the most, like, flat way possible. And then it ends with a fucking Bond joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of what makes it so great. Like, it's it's just all of the expressiveness, despite how dark it is. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to mention, though, while we're talking about this, and, and like that those tonal issues and things you see in other movies, Wes Anderson's soundtracks are usually, like, really poppy. Um, mm -hmm. li like, he likes big and bombastic music and stuff, but this movie has, like, a much more subdued score. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, like, the tone is both colorful, but it's also kind of eerie, if you know his work, where, like, it never, it never out and out blows up in your face the way his other movies kind of do. Yeah, it's, um, it's very driving score. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, I have no... It, this is a weird thing to talk about, but like if this had been a similar script, obviously the dialogue would have to change here and there. But let's let's take the plot of this. This could easily be adapted to be a thriller, suspense thriller, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, with anyone else, with anyone else directing it, it, it very much could have become that. What's interesting is I still feel like the score fits for that tone of a movie. Yeah. 
Um, like, I don't think it would have to change at all. It's just the, the quirkiness. It's like Wes Anderson applied his quirkiness to a pre-existing suspense thriller movie. And, like, this, for some reason, they already had the score all worked out, and he just had to work with that. The music to this is, like, it's really kind of operatic. Like, it's there to sort of, like, supplement the tone and the dialogue and the actors and stuff. It's not really... Like, in his other movies, it's more of, like, a driving force. Like, you're emotionally with the score, kind of like in, in the Dark Knight trilogy with Hans Zimmer. Like, the the music is the heartbeat to those movies. It's kind of like mm-hmm. how it is in his other movies, um, where, like, the music is important. The music tells you how to prepare for each scene. It doesn't really do that here. It's almost... Like, I don't want to insult it, but it's kind of like elevator music, where, like, it's consistent, and it's there, and it underscores things that are happening, but... It's not a thing unto itself. It's not a score you just listen to. It works because of the movie it's in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that um, probably has something to do with uh, the setting we're talking about. Like yeah. a different time period, in a ho- mostly in a hotel. Um, so you're not really going to hear any, you know, 70s Stone songs. Well, now that you um, mention that, like, it's, it's really like hotel lobby music then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like lounge music. Yeah, there exactly. You go. Like like a jukebox style thing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um Can we talk about my favorite scene? Oh boy, what what is your favorite scene? Oh, it's definitely the museum scene. Oh, I love that scene. <sighs> it's like got all the weird quirky jokes. Like I love that someone apparently goes and changes the sign every minute that the museum is about to close. <laughs> Because that's fucking Looney Tunes right there. That is that is goddamn Looney Tunes that someone would actually do that shit. Um, and, and yet it's like the most... I think it's the most naturally intense scene in the movie. It's, it's, it's like fucking Michael Myers in Halloween. <laughs> um, and yet it's got this odd quirkiness. It's like, oh, I'll go to a museum to run away from this person. Why wouldn't she just stay on the tram? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's such a I don't know, it just it just works for me. I just really like that scene, especially the when he when Jeff Goldblum is walking down all the uh the halls of um armor. Yeah. I love that shot. It's so fucking cool the way that's lit. Um and just the again, things are just communicated to you perfectly visually you not just visually um through the tools of filmmaking you hear the click 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 of defoe's boots and then you see him stop and you're like okay he's gonna pull out a gun or a knife or something and you see him like fiddling with something and you realize he's taken off his boots so you can't hear him walk anymore defoe? that's so perfect defoe is just perfect in this movie in general like how it just subdued he is and terrifying this came out the same year as john wick um and so he played a sniper in john wick and it's weird how like william defoe is a very very talented and dynamic actor that can do a lot of things but in the same year he played kind of the same role twice and both times (laughs) it's perfect and terrifying and you really don't know what to think of him until the end of the movie (laughs) um he he's great in this. I love everything about him. He kind of because man, as you mentioned, no country for old man. He's kind of like Javier Bardem from that movie in this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's weird because there's like that s- scene where it's it's a chase scene, like any other chase scene, except it's kooky as fuck because it's downhill skiing. <laughs> That's just fucking silly. If like, anyone all... else made it, to be like a James Bond style, like epic chase, but it's not. Yeah, it's just like these really awkward camera angles and this really obviously like animated. Um... <laughs> I mean, when when he starts going down that hill, he fucking turn. He tur- he passes that bridge and turns into a cartoon. It literally becomes Wile E. Coyote at that point. Mm-hmm. And and that's just great. Like, even, the motherfucker's even on the side of a cliff and then gets pushed off and goes, all the way down. It's it's literally a, a Wile E. Coyote cartoon, but instead of the desert, it's in the mountains. And that's just, it's it's so totally off, but works in such a strange way. Um, 
And you know it's it's weird. I don't know what to make of this because I'm not. It, it had to be intentional. You wouldn't phrase it like this unless it was intentional. But so the um, guy says after after Defoe gets pushed up the cliff, he's like, a moment of silence for a servant who died in the work, who died in the line of duty performing a great. De- performing a task assigned to them by their master or whatever. <laughs> that functions for both Defoe and the the guy that was hiding out in the monastery. That little prayer he gives functions for both of those characters perfectly. It's weird. It's it's really well constructed. Like the these types of coincidences and like parallels and stuff like Wes Anderson is acutely aware of and has them noted everywhere. Um a Wes Anderson script is a blueprint, and you don't fuck with it. Yeah, and I just I find that that little exchange of dialogue interesting, and it stood out to me because at first I thought, okay, that's weird that he's saying a prayer for Defoe, but whatever. Um, and then Zero says the name of the the guy hiding out of the monster. I'm like, oh, yeah, they are the same thing. That's interesting that he would draw my attention to this. Um. I just, since I only saw it the one time, I can't quite decide why he felt the need to do that, but it's an interesting choice. Nothing? Okay. Yeah, no, no, you're right. I mean, it's... I agree. That's that's all I have to say. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's interesting, and it's, it's... I'm sure there's, like, a deeper reason. I just, I don't know it. So I was hoping to pick at least Steve's brain. I mean, I don't know. It's There's so much going on, I didn't think of that initially, but you're right. Um, and there's lots of parallels in this movie all throughout for characters like this. Like, everyone's kind of doing their job the same way. Um, Zero has no emotional, or shouldn't ideally have any emotional investment for, like, 50% of this movie. So he's just kind of doing his job all the way throughout. It's like that, that kind of functions for him as well. We have no reason to believe Gustav's doing anything for any reason other than that as well. So, like, I think it works for every character. It's just, it's a dimension I never really considered, and I imagine it's completely on purpose. Um, Even if you put it to the Nazi background, Nazi soldiers are just like, I did it because I was told to, and they celebrated that. And then Sartre got all pissed off and wrote a really good paper. Yeah. Um. (laughs) (laughs) No, and that's exactly what it is, and... I don't know. It it's interesting. Um, well, I feel like the I, only yeah. Uh, sorry, I was just saying. I feel like Not, the only like passionate experiences in this movie for Zero are one he gets married and two he buys the hotel. Like everything else is kind of depressed and matter of fact. Okay, when you say passionate, you mean like emotionally passionate? Yeah. Okay. Because so I was gonna say when Old Zero cries, that was a really shocking scene. Oh no, I agree. I agree. I just mean like the way the narrative is framed, it, it feels like emotional investment and passion happened to him twice in his life that that we're Mm -hmm. seeing and like old zero is just reacting to it after the fact gotcha yeah uh manos you were gonna say something oh uh we long passed that point so uh okay no worries well speaking of points we long passed steve mentioned how shane black's like big setup and payoff guy and so just because i wanted to make this joke and that is why the giant teddy bear in Iron Man 3 is a super important character piece for well, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, <laughs> it is, because he gives it as a gift, and it's overcompensating, and it's massive, just like his armory, and it gets blown up at the house, and we see it get blown up just like his armor's at the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's perfect. That's, that's my point. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I was going to make that joke earlier. And then, like, we just moved past it too quickly, but since we were just talking about moving past two thing, things, I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to take us back. <laughs> and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Um, next year, Wes Anderson's making another stop-motion animated film um, called... It's got something to do with dogs. It's a dog movie, um, but Brian Cranston's in it, as well as his regular set of actors. Um at some point before that movie comes out, I'd love to show you Fantastic Mr. Fox just to get your perspective on the animation and stuff for that movie. It's George Clooney in that, right? Uh, yeah. Fantastic Mr. Fox? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Um, um, 
Yeah, like I said, I've seen I've seen bits and pieces of his stuff. Around. I know Meryl Streep's in it, and I know like William Defoe, Bill Murray, Owen Wilson, like his usual people are there too. I think Clooney's there. I think he's the main guy. I don't remember. It's been a long time since I've seen that movie. Mm. I like that that these directors kind of have a posse. Like yeah. you, yeah, you know when when something's a Nolan film because like Michael Caine, Morgan Freeman, fucking Christian Bale will be in that shit. Yeah, um, they've they've got their crew. They know how to work with them. Yeah, it's it's funny to see how that works out. They got they got a, a posse. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, I can say I certainly enjoyed this movie. And Wes Anderson's just one of those guys. I'm like, oh yeah, I've heard of him, but I just I don't have a reason why I never sat down and watched any of his movies. I just. Didn't have the opportunity, didn't, like, feel the need, I guess. You mentioned this with when whenever we talk about Kubrick. Um, I feel like this is the same sort of thing where, like, if I want to just pop in Dark Knight, I will just pop in Dark Knight. I have to be in a mood to watch a Wes Anderson movie. Mm. Like, there is a kind of patience that they require, despite being so short. Like, they're not conventional blockbuster, even even just standardly, standardly well-made films. Like... They're masterclasses scene for scene. They're meticulously crafted. They're very methodical. Sometimes they're very, very dry. Like, they're hard movies to get into just to sit down and show people. Mm. Um, I think Tarantino has that to a degree, but Tarantino's more adrenaline rushy than, than Wes Anderson has ever been. Tarantino's more got more mass appeal. Yeah, think, yeah. Like I can, I can just watch Pulp Fiction if I want to. I, it helps to be in the mood, but I don't have to be. With Wes Anderson, like I can't just sit down and watch this movie. It would feel like it took forever if I wasn't in the mood for it. <laughs> yeah, I think Tarantino does understand um, mass audience and audiences a little bit better. Um, yeah. Yeah, just Tarantino knows how to make a movie that like is deep, but at the same time is perfectly watchable. Tarantino, if you don't want to think. Like, like, Tarantino is that guy that grew up watching tons of movies, but he also grew up, like, being excited by film, so, like, I think he brings that to his stuff, whereas I think Wes Anderson is more of, like, film is a fascinating art form, let me write you a thesis in the form of a two-hour movie. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, like, yeah, um, I think that's the big difference, and Kubrick is sort of the same way, I think. Certainly, again, he was... He was Kubrick's more like the painter, um, in my mind. Like, I always say this about his films. A lot of his shots go on for entirely too long, and that's okay because they're gorgeous. It's like watching a portrait in motion. Um, which, on, anyway. Which, yeah. Well, oh, like you, you talked about in one of your old videos. It's like, you know, he, yeah, that's, he was a that's always been he came out of photography into film. Yeah, it's it's meant to just be. Hey, look at this really gorgeous shot. The elevators of um, blood and the shining, I think, are the favorite example. Like that's a painting. They shot that fucking for weeks, mm -hmm. for fucking weeks, over and over again. They had to reset the miniatures like a million <laughs> fucking times. Oh, it's Christ! <laughs> Could you imagine if the man had digital? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> he would never have to stop recording. <laughs> Actors would be worth to death. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love, I love Kubrick movies. They're so much fun. Oh, Jesus Christ. My only hope for, like, the acting community if Kubrick had lived into the digital age of film would be that he would be one of the guys who's just like, no, no, film stock's better. <laughs> like, that, and I doubt he would have. I think he would have so taken the tools and run with them. Um, I feel like Kubrick's the type of person where, like, the less human error possible, the happier he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, um, Hitchcock, I think, is the same way. Random question. I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but worth asking anyway. Is Wes Anderson in this film using digital or film, or do you not he know? He uses both. Or, or no, okay. I mean, um, yeah, he, he shot this in digital, yes. Okay, I was I was thinking so because the colors really really pop. Well, he it's 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 tricky because like there are certain aspect ratios and stuff like he gets through with like old school cameras and stuff, but for the most part it's digital. Gotcha. Um, you know, okay, that legit bugged the fuck out of me. That 
dude, like I said, I stopped my TV when we went when we first go to the flashback because I was like, wait, shit, I have sidebars. Why the fuck do I have sidebars? Did I have sidebars <laughs> before and I just not notice it? What the fuck's up with the goddamn sidebars? And like, what really fucked with me, and I'm probably revealing too much, but the version of this I watched, like the first couple seconds said. Make sure your TV is in 16 by 9 as- aspect ratio. I'm like, uh, okay. So I double check that, and it is. And I'm like, I st- and so I go back, and I'm like, why the fuck are- do I have sidebars? And I go back to the stuff before the sidebars, I'm like, there aren't fucking sidebars! What is this shit? What the fuck's he doing? So Steve, what the fuck's he doing? <laughs> um, it helps. If you saw this in a theater, I did not, but it helps if you saw this in a theater, so, like, you were less panicky about the aspect ratio on, on the thing you have. Um, okay, part of what I think he's doing with the, with the aspect ratio, which I think is, is legitimately interesting, is that the aspect ratio, the further you get back in time, the more modern the ratio becomes. Um, and so there's this really interesting device going on where, like we keep saying, like, everyone has a narrative and everyone has, like, loose threads and disclosure, truth, yada, yada, yada. You can rewatch the video up to this point. Um, I think there, I think he's trying to, to almost, like, try and make you understand that everything that you are seeing is being framed. So, like, you open with very small a very small box, but as the movie progresses, like, Gustav's in jail, there are characters that are framed by doors, there are characters that, in a movie, you don't do hyper-close-ups like it's television, but... Sometimes he does that, but he sh- but the aspect ratio converts it so it almost looks like it's a TV episode. Um, he's playing with the literal framing of the movie so that the framing of the characters and the framing of the narrative becomes so much more literal. Um, I love the thing in the beginning where the author is giving his speech and it's framed like it's a, like like maybe like my old school television, but then that gets broken when you see the thing with his kid. And that's a consistent thing throughout the movie where, like, people are in frames or being literally framed or are behind frames or trying to steal frames. And they always, in some sense, break down and, like, it's always about dislodging the frame. Um, The fact that it's about a painting, the fact that Gustav gets framed, the fact that he is behind frames, the fact that people stand in front of doors. Like, everything in this movie is about framing. Interesting. There's a lot there. There's a lot to it. Um... And I've seen other people use literal aspect ratios to, like, analyze movies in other respects. I feel like Wes Anderson here does it more interestingly and more methodically because it do, it, it's, it's a very cinematic thing, but it doesn't necessarily feel like you're watching a movie. I don't think this is the kind of movie that you need to see in a theater, with, with, with the exception of stuff like... Like, Hateful Eight's a movie I don't think plays as well on a small screen... This doesn't have that problem. And so, like, the way you're looking at it and what's actually happening, there's a bit of dissonance there. Just, like, the character being bluntly honest about things is not the same thing as you understanding what they mean. Mm. Okay. No, like, and, and that's something I'd have to watch the movie multiple times to start to pick up on on my own. So, as it was, that just bugged the fuck out of me. Because, like, my pet peeve... Excuse me. My pet peeve with a lot of shit is... God, I fucking hate black bars so much. <laughs> if I can do it, I will. I, I will honestly cut off either the bottom of the frame or like the very top of the frame to get rid of black bars. I, I will make that sacrifice. Cause God, I hate black bars. I have a 4K television. I want to watch the fucking TV and not like like I feel like with so many things. The black bars get so big, you can actually overlay them the, over the video, so you're technically watching more black than video. <laughs> and that bugs the fuck out of me. Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel, when, when Fox re-released those DVDs in HD, and same with Dragon Ball Z with those orange bricks that came out like 14 years ago, um, they didn't like black bars either. So they zoomed the crap of zoomed the crap in out of all, all those, those episodes, and so like parts of the episodes get cut off, but there are no black bars, and people fucking revolted. And to this day, they have not corrected it. Oh really? I, I am so okay with that. I'm watching through Dragon Ball Z on my um, laptop, and I I'm, I'm fucking in love with it. You know, I gotta tell I'm, you, when, I, they, I, when I, they when they zoom in like that, you really you, you miss more of the the picture than you would if you had the black bars. I used to go in this argument all the time when uh, when letterboxing became a thing. 
Mm -hmm. And people would go, oh, I keep looking at the fucking black bar. It's like, well, is the movie good? Because you should be looking at that. Um, And I would constantly have to explain, like, you know, you know, I could, you know, you could show scenes from Ghostbusters, and Ghostbusters, when it was originally on video and pan and scan, it was terrible. You would, you would miss so many things. I remember like um, seeing it for the first few times on you know, regular TV, and like I am remembering things wrong with what I'm seeing here. And then I'd see it on Letterbox, and I was like, oh, okay, there, there's the shots. There, uh, you know, that's what I should be seeing. Um, you know, I'd get in those arguments all the time. And uh, I've even seen, uh, I can't remember which Dragon Ball Z. There's a Dragon Ball Z where I've seen aired where it has, uh, I can't remember what network uh, showed it. They had, they had, they didn't have black bars, but they had like color. Yeah, when they used to like fill in the frame. Like, oh, that was worse. That's more distracting than black bars. I really hated that. Yeah. Yeah. Conan did a bit about this fucking years ago when he was still on late night. Um, and he's like, yeah, I realize that we're not really doing anything with the screen space because we don't broadcast in HD, so I figured we'd just start doing stuff there. And so for those of you that don't have an HD television, let me show you what we've got going on in the spot that would otherwise just be black bars tonight. And he, like, zooms out his fucking, like, dolphins doing tricks in water. <laughs> <laughs> Which would be the most distracting shit ever. <laughs> um, I don't really have like a dog in the fight of of black bars or no black bars. My issue is just when upgrading destroys preservation. Where like in in the West, the dubs of Dragon Ball Z will never be the same again because now all there is is the zoom dip. Yeah, and that's fucking annoying. But at the same time, I watch Buffy all the time with with without black bars, and I don't give a shit. Yeah, and see, that's for me. It's like I I prefer to just if it doesn't ruin shots, like completely destroy them. Yeah, I'm okay with zooming in. But at a certain point, yeah, if the if the shots like like I wouldn't want to see to stick with Dragon Ball. I wouldn't want to see the the shot of Goku, um, you know, flying towards King Piccolo with Uz, with Uzaru behind him. I wouldn't want to see that cropped at all right um but and I mean, regardless it's, it's a little bit different with television too like because television's designed for naturally smaller screens i think it's a bigger problem with movies and stuff like i wouldn't want i don't want shots compromised from like a kubrick movie or a hitchcock movie or star wars or something like that yeah yeah um or for like some kind of fucking monstrosity of a cg dinosaur to just cover up the frame for a good 30 seconds in a goddamn <laughs> star wars movie for no fucking reason um Shit like that. Anyway, all right. So we're, I think we're we're about exhausted talking about this movie. Yeah, um, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and go on to ratings. Um, Steve, why don't you go first? All right, I am going to give this five out of five multi-layered framing devices. Nice, nice. I'm gonna go ahead and give this four point five out of five. Uh, coat checks for one dead Persian cat. <laughs> <laughs> like, they took the time to zoom in on that fucking ticket. Uh, how about you, Manos? I think, if I remember correctly, I think I may have even reviewed this on my channel when it came out in theaters. Oh, yes, you did. And uh, I believe, if I can remember correctly, I think I gave it five out of five Ram chips. Okay, but no, you can't use yours. You got to use a, a noun from the movie. Noun from the movie. Oh Jesus, I don't know. Um, uh, five out of five uh, dead concierges. <laughs> okay, good enough. Good enough. It's cool. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching this one. Uh, what the fuck are we gonna talk about next week? Hmm. Shit. Next week is Rasco's topic. No, no, it's your topic, isn't it? It is, yeah. it is, and I don't know what to fucking talk about. Um, well, think about video games lately, so I want to do something on that. Um, hmm. Oh, what would be a good one? Ooh, I don't know how much mileage we'll get out of this, but, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be something. Why don't we talk about, like, favorite or most unique gaming 
devices. Not not like consoles or computers or anything like that. I mean like things gameplay devices, I guess you'd call it. Where in You mean like you know like like time like time manipulation in Prince of Persia. Oh, oh, okay. Like gameplay device. I thought you meant more like like the controllers thing you can buy. Yeah. yeah, controller types, shit like that. No 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 no. I remember and that shit thing that t- um what was it? Sega Genesis or Nintendo had that big red thing that stood in that tripod that you looked Oh, at. that was weird. <laughs> um, and then the power glow. Fucking hated the power glow. Mm-hmm. But you're playing with power. <laughs> yeah, it says it right in the name, Steve. <laughs> Regular show. Steve I don't really does think about everything. this. I loved it. Steve really does hate everything. I do. Um, I, really do. I know. No, it's like specifically about devices of gameplay. Right, right. Like within like, the game itself. Yeah. Yeah. And so that'll make titling it a bitch, and I have no idea how much mileage we'll get out of it, but we'll find out next week well, on Geeky Gentlemen. I gotta replay some video games now, damn. I, yeah, right? Well, um, I'm not gonna be able to guest star next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, this is like, back in my day, I like my favorite gameplay device was the Monopoly guy. <laughs> see. Well, you know... I- Let's see, I, I kind of took the spaceship back and forth in Galaga. Side to side, is that good? I don't know. Um, I mean, nothing's ever exciting. I know how to fight Jung Lee, that's, that's all, all I know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, everyone, thanks very much for watching. Until next time, I'm the philosopher. I am the exile. And I am the realist. And we are your geeky gentlemen. And we will be discussing things. <laughs>